Welcome back, everybody. Many interesting famous flights come from books, movies, or even television shows that are set in some semblance of reality. Our famous flight today comes from a 2002 movie that itself was set in the year 2020. If you enjoy this or any of the videos on the channel, be sure to like, subscribe, and consider supporting the channel on Patreon. It really helps. Reign of Fire is a movie about dragons taking over the Earth after being awoken in the year 2000. The movie, while its overall premise is fantastical, starts in real-world England as it existed in 2000, along with technology of the early 2000s and realistic physics. The Kentucky Irregulars, a paramilitary group from the United States, use a tank, a helicopter, automatic weapons appropriate to the era, and some vaguely feasible tactics to battle the dragons. In the movie, those Kentucky Irregulars, led by Denton Van Zan, who played by Matthew McConaughey, arrive at a makeshift community led by Christian Bale's character Quinn Abercrombie. And that's where our flight is described. When asked how his American unit got to Bale's English community, McConaughey's quote is, We rebuilt a National Guard C-5A, flew it 8,000 miles on two engines, and tried to set it down on the old strip outside of Manchester. Lost 122 men and most of my fuel. Bale responds with skepticism and indicates that nothing has been flying since around 2000 when the dragons emerged. While the movie itself is an odd one, that flight sounds interesting. In order to reverse engineer the details about the flight, we have to consider that the dragons emerged in the year 2000. In addition, the movie talks about nuclear and chemical warfare the world waged with the dragons beginning shortly thereafter. So for our purposes, any information or details we use will be based on the world as it existed in the year 2000. We're fortunate that Van Zan is so specific in his description of the plane. A National Guard C-5A. That type of aircraft assigned to that type of military component wouldn't have been particularly common in the year 2000. Literally, the only National Guard unit I've been able to find that was operating that aircraft at that time was the 105th Airlift Wing of the New York Air National Guard based at Stewart Air National Guard Base near Newburgh, New York. As Van Zandt talks about rebuilding a C-5, we at full throttle will approach this as though his team located a National Guard C-5 that was down for maintenance at its base when the apocalypse started. So the plane may have been left in a maintenance hangar while the world collapsed due to the dragon onslaught. This presents a couple issues. First, Van Zandt's unit is repeatedly described as the Kentucky Irregulars, so it's pretty likely that Van Zandt, at least, came from Kentucky. He and his unit would have had to travel from Kentucky to Newburgh, New York, which is just north of New York City. However, given the unit's proven dragon-slaying abilities in the movie, this is rather plausible. However, Van Zan also mentioned that they flew the plane 8,000 miles and landed in Manchester. He must have been being hyperbolic. There's no way that he flew from anywhere in the United States and traveled 8,000 statute or nautical miles to get there. Even if he had flown from the state furthest from the United Kingdom, Hawaii, the trip would have only been 6,144 nautical miles. So given Van Zandt's details about the plane, it's safe to assume he was exaggerating the distance to make a point. It's also worth noting that with Van Zandt's crew being the Kentucky Irregulars, the 165th Airlift Squadron in Louisville, Kentucky would have been an option. Except that they've flown the Dirty 130s, C-130 Hercules, since 1992, so that wasn't an option in the lore. Perhaps Van Zandt's crew could have taken a Herc from Kentucky to New York, but it's unlikely there would have been a C-5 in Kentucky. Problematic for us here is that we don't have a flyable C-5 in any of our simulators. However, the Boeing 747-800 will suffice for our testing. The C-5A is 247 feet long, 222 feet wide, and 65 feet tall. It also has an empty weight of 380,000 pounds and a max takeoff weight of 920,000 pounds. The 747 we're going to use, on the other hand, is 3 feet longer, 2 feet wider, and a foot and a half 
shorter. However, its empty weight is a full 100,000 pounds heavier, and its maximum takeoff weight is about 70,000 pounds greater than the C5s. So physically, the planes are very comparable, but the 747-800 is much heavier. However, it also has more powerful engines. So the 747-800 serves as a fairly decent analog for our purposes here. In the movie, Van Zandt's group utilizes a Chieftain tank and a light helicopter, an Augusta Westland AW-109, along with some utility trucks to transport themselves and their gear. Now, as an initial matter, the Chieftain is a British tank, so we're safe to assume it was acquired after they landed in England. However, we will assume that they brought the Augusta Westland with them in the C5, and at least a few utility trucks as well. Also, we know they lost 122 men by the time they reached Bale's village. While the 747 we're flying is technically a passenger variant in Microsoft Flight Simulator, we're gonna treat it as though it is a cargo configuration. To be frank, even with the helicopter, at least 200 troops averaging a hefty 200 pounds and adjustment for the differences between the C5 and the 747. We have plenty of cargo capacity to play with. The Augusta Westland only weighs 3,505 pounds empty, so that leaves us with plenty of capacity for troops and cargo. Obviously, Van Zandt's crew would have wanted to take as much fuel as possible for the flight and to offload for use with the helicopter and vehicles upon arrival. So we'll start with Max maximum fuel in the 747 and we'll shoot for as much cargo as they would have risked when taking off with only two engines. It's not like they would get another chance if the takeoff went poorly. So we'll give it a shot with 75% of the maximum potential payload considering the maximum amount of fuel already on board. So after the helicopter, we've got around 57,000 pounds to fill up with vehicles, food, troops, and weapons. Now Van Zandt talks about trying to land on an old strip outside of Manchester, England. Particularly as they were flying such a large aircraft, they were probably aiming for the primary passenger airport in the area. With two parallel runways each of more than 10,000 feet, Manchester Airport on the south side of the city of Manchester fits the description and was likely Van Zandt's destination when they departed. Of course, it could have also been that they took off without an exact destination in the UK and simply happened to land outside of Manchester when they identified the large runways there. Either way, we know they landed at Manchester and that's where we are headed. When Van Zandt indicated they'd flown to the UK from the US, Bale's character indicates skepticism and notes that the air is the dragon's territory. Van Zandt responds that it's human territory and the dragons are just renting it. Ultimately, it turns out the dragons have excellent vision during the day and at night. However, their vision during twilight, so during sunrise and sunset, while still good, is not as excellent as other times of day. So any flight certainly would have taken this circumstance into account. We'll shoot to take off and land during twilight. Knowing Van Zandt from the movie, it's safe to say he would have tried to perform the flight as soon as the plane was up and running but he may have timed it so that it would have significance if possible. Particularly since the plane was located in New York State and this group likely had to travel to it, this probably would not have been a winter flight. Also, since we know 20 years passed from when the dragons emerged to when the events of the movie took place, we'll presume it took Van Zandt and his crew a number of years to figure out how to kill the dragons, get everything together for the flight, fix the plane, and depart for Manchester. If I were Van Zandt and was heading to the UK to end the global war with dragons, I probably would have tried to leave as close to the 4th of July, our Independence Day, as possible. However, they would have been beholden to the weather. They needed strong winds right down the runway to have any hope of getting airborne. So for our attempt, we'll set the date at July 5th, 2005. They also would have had the ability to observe the weather around the field, so we'll go with clear but windy weather that day, and once we're around 100 miles from the field, we'll set it to live weather. We're not going to fly this using clear weather the whole way. They simply couldn't have known how the weather was further from them after the dragon apocalypse.
Obviously, Van Zandt and his crew would have wanted to use the full length of the runway given that they were only using two engines. So we're going to use thrust reversers to get back the camera here. We're a little off center, but that's, that's the camera's doing. I don't even feel bad about that. Perfect. Okay, 75% payload. Outer engines are cut. Flaps 10%. I think we are good. Okay, throttle's up. Powered up, brakes release. Flight of the Dragon Slayer here. Seventy knots, eighty. And that's with that headwind. This is going to be snug. One twenty. We want to be up around 160-ish, ideally. 130. Obviously none of these lights would have been on with the actual dragons. Rotate. Nose wheels up. Come on. Come on, 153. Come on. Come on. Oh. Must have, must have hit the tail, or maybe you caught a wing. I'm not sure. Okay, we're once again backed into position here. We're gonna reduce the payload with how heavy that is. Let's go with, uh, let's try 70% total payload. Still 100% fuel. 70% total payload, that leaves uh, 25,000 pounds below the max takeoff weight. Flaps, brakes, throttles. Here we go. Sixty five knots. The beeping was because I was over speed technically before the end of the runway. It was a warning that I was beginning to use a non runway surface for takeoff. Yeah, I know. One ten. Try and get the nose wheel off to reduce some friction here. It's going to increase our drag just a little bit by getting our angle of attack higher. But we got to reduce that friction if we want to have any hope of getting off here. 150. This is where we lost it last time. 155. Come on. Pulling back. Come on. Oh, 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 come on now. 
aggressively nose high. 155 airspeed. Gear up. Whoop. Hit the button twice. There we go. Gear up. Come on, you. Oh, boy. Come on. A vertical airspeed over on the, uh, over on the right there. We're just barely sinking, if anything, right now. Two hundred, two hundred feet. Ah, come on, come on, come on, come on. Sustained slow flight right here. That's my stall shaker. Boy, we are just barely clearing these buildings. Four hundred feet. Come on now. Might be able to use this river. Might be able to use the river. Whoa! <laughs> Forgot to turn off the ATC voices. So we might be able to use this river to help just gain some speed. go turn along this river just to try and build up some airspeed come on ah. dragon slayer tree four fife and niner foxtrot switching good day Obviously, all these lights and this other airport you can see out in front of us, they would not be lit in the dragon apocalypse. 160, though, here. We gotta. I've still got one notch of flaps in. We're gonna have to drop that here pretty soon. But we're, we're 700 feet, highest we've been thus far. Seventy knots. Try and I've got my vertical speed right here. You can see if I'm trending up or down. That's kind of what I'm chasing right now. I want to be either up or neutral. Oh my goodness! We're sinking. Get that. We just got to get some airspeed built up so we can get some altitude. But when we're flying at this angle of attack, it's going to be tough. All right, 190. We're getting there. I would think that Van Zan and his crew. Probably would have cleared out any drag. Oh gosh, we're sinking. We're sinking. Come on now. Come on now. Come back to me. Come back to me. At this point, I'm manipulating the trim. I was full, full yoke back the whole time. Full control column back, I suppose. The whole time there, I'm having to start to adjust my uh, my trim to help with the lift. Uh, I would presume that Van Zandt and his crew would have cleaned out the dragons kind of around the airfield while they were working on the C5. So, you know, being as low as I am out here isn't great, but uh, 
probably wouldn't have been fatal for us. Nearly 200 knots, 1,400 feet, and we're climbing 1,000 feet a minute. That's, that's what I'm talking about right there. A little sunrise happening up in front of us there. Now, I'm not exactly familiar, I don't recall what the GPS technology would have been like in 2005, but at least the autopilot would have functioned such that they could have given it a heading and possibly even a direct waypoint to navigate to. So we are going to end up using the GPS to help kind of fly this. GPS is satellite based and there would have been a receiver in the airplane so even with the dragon apocalypse happening on the ground unless unless they're space dragons I mean heck who knows at this point the GPS probably still would have worked in space and then if Van Zant and his crew would have gotten excuse me Van Zan and his crew could have gotten it working here on the plane then that would have been great for us even if they wouldn't have been able to then it just would have been a matter of a, kind of a team of navigators and pilots and whatnot. Oh, it's a beautiful sunrise to keep the plane on course. Also, running on only two engines, they couldn't have verified that the plane was appropriately pressurized, so we are going to stay at 15,000 feet. I'm going to try and go no higher than that just to avoid issues like hypoxia in case there was a pressurization issue within the airplane. All right, well, believe it or not, we've managed to get up to about 15,000 feet here, and we're well on our way to 320 knots. We are going to go ahead and switch to live weather here. We're about, um, about 100 nautical miles from where we started. Let's see what the weather's doing. Okay, not too bad. Got some fairly friendly clouds out here this morning, luckily. Okay, at this point they're leaving the United States. We've got uh, kind of Nova Scotia right here, New Brunswick, um, Prince Edward Island, and uh, we're probably either just about to leave Maine or already have. It's, it's pretty close, so departing the continental United States right here. Okay, over Prince Edward Island, going to be setting out into the Gulf of St. Lawrence here, probably right around Alberton-ish. Well, on our way to Newfoundland. Going to be leaving Newfoundland here momentarily, probably in the, uh, like, the Paquette area on the map. Headed out over the ocean. It's not too late to turn back here, but you know, Van Zan wasn't gonna turn back, of course. And our route's not really gonna take us near Greenland or anything, so um, we'll see how the weather is with live weather on the way. Obviously, Van Zan's crew wouldn't have known. Um, in this particular plane, we do have the ability to have kind of a weather radar turned on. I don't know if Van Zan and his crew would have gotten that going, but we will see. So 
certainly looks like we're feet wet at this point. Out into the Atlantic. Alright, so I went ahead and clicked on the weather radar just in case it would have been working in the C-5 that they were flying. If that aircraft even has that, I'm not totally sure, but either way, it'll be helpful for us here flying at 15,000 feet. That's kind of showing us the levels of precipitation out in front of us. Not necessarily convective activity, so it may not be thunderstorms it's indicating. Or, as it were, uh, blizzards or something. Alrighty. And also, I am a little bit disappointed in myself that I didn't think about it. I, sh I should have turned off all the lights before I took off. They, they wouldn't have been taking off with the, you know, the dragons and whatnot with their landing lights and navigation lights and stuff like that on. So, my fault, my fault. Okay, well, the weather out here is not particularly great. Using live weather, that was of course going to be a risk, and it would have been a risk for Van Zandt's crew as well. Now, we've got the benefit of some weather radar here, so we know that we've got some heavier precipitation, or at least more water droplets out in some dense clouds. Obviously, the red is not great on the radar, and we're going to just try and avoid it here a little bit. Because I'm using live weather and I happen to be flying this in the real world in, uh, in uh, February, we're going to try and avoid some of these clouds so we don't get icing. By the way, if you haven't thought about it, the temperature drops about 3 degrees per 1,000 feet of altitude. So it may be 90 degrees on the ground, but you may still have icing conditions when you fly if you happen to be flying through any type of moisture, so. We are running into icing here on this flight, undoubtedly. I've got anti-icing on, and we're just gonna kinda keep going with that. Okay, a bit of a development as we continue the flight here. You guys remember how red was bad on the radar? Red, red isn't great. So if red is bad, pink is also more bad. As you can see, we're in the midst of some badness. Again, this doesn't necessarily indicate thunderstorms or thunder snow or anything like that, but it's just very heavy precipitation, which is not exactly what we want to be in. One of your options when you're dealing with bad weather, particularly in icing conditions, is to find the layers and fly between them. The water droplets are the greater risk as you're flying through them, so if you can get between the cloud layers, you have a little bit less risk of icing you know, structural problems. It's still not great, and it's still exceedingly dangerous, but here, we've managed to find the layer at about 10,500 feet. I will take it. Who knows what conditions Van Zandt's crew would have run into, but I know that in the simulation here are too many problems with the uh, sh structure of the aircraft. We will crash. Okay, well, great news. We broke out of all the, the clouds. And we, uh, Ireland's in sight. This is great. It is gorgeous. Now, for this first kind of trip, for the first effort here of locating the airfield, I'm gonna turn off the VFR map and zoom way out on my GPS so that we're actually having to look for the thing I would like to do it from the cockpit, but I can't really slew... I can't really slew the pilot's head around. I can't, like, lean forward really effectively to look out the window. So I'm probably gonna have to use third-person view to find the airfield. 
Okay, we're out over the Irish Sea at this point. I'm going to turn off the VFR map. And my, uh... We'll see if we can find this thing. I'm going to and turn down the brightness on that GPS too, so I, I really just can't see anything. Okay. Yeah, okay, we got Liverpool below us. Manchester should be in front of us, and the airport should be just a little bit south of Manchester. I am not familiar with this area, so we'll see what we can do. Also not totally sure what time it's going to get dark here. So we want to be landing at twilight as well. We've definitely got some landing options down there. Looks like a little... Yeah. That looks promising. This little racetrack looks promising. And we'd be wildly too heavy for that racetrack, but... Could probably do it. Okay... Where is the field? Um, so that must be, is that Manchester? I'm thinking that must be Manchester. Which means the field, there it is. There it is, okay. Just kinda in, off Liverpool, there's a body of water back there. Okay. And we've got, yeah, we got the two parallel runways. Okay. Well, at this point, we just need to go hold somewhere until evening, basically, until it starts to get dark. I don't know what time it would get dark here this time of year. It's, at least in terms of latitude, I would think, kind of similar to our northernmost states here in the United States, uh, absent Alaska, of course, kind of our northernmost continental United States. So I'd guess probably around nine o'clock, something like that. Now, of course, it's entirely possible in the movie world that the airport would have been significantly damaged or not necessarily recognizable because of the war or something, but uh, it's gonna work for us. Okay, I'm not going to do a holding pattern over the field because I don't want to draw the dragon's attention. So what we're going to do is probably go hold out over the Irish Sea or maybe over Ireland. We'll, we'll just kind of see how we're feeling. I think I'm going to head back over Ireland first and then come back in. And then we will see about possibly just kind of holding around the Isle of Man. Since we've got ground contact more or less since we can see the ground the the isle of man is a great kind of holding point for our purposes but that might be too close to say the irish dragons or some other um england dragons that you know may get stirred up i just i just don't know You know, our biggest problem with all of this is that we don't know the specifications of the surface to air dragons, how good their ears are, how well they can see the plane.
Okay, that sun is starting to get pretty low, and we still gotta get back, verify that we can find the runway one more time, and then land right around twilight. So we are gonna head back to the field here. This is working out pretty good, in terms of timing at least. We've got uh, 9.08 p.m. I think, I think that's local, I think it adjusts for local time. Crank it straight to the east here. Should take us kind of right along the coastline to at least where we can identify Liverpool. And then head on into the field. I've been kind of half hand flying this and half autopilot, so. Uh, my autopilot settings are a bit wonky at the moment. But that's okay. I should mention I do have a uh, kind of a Google map pulled up next to me here that's just uh, like road maps. As Van Zandt's crew likely would have had just to give them some idea of the geography. Kind of what they were looking for. Okay. That little body of water right there is going to kind of lead us up to Manchester. We've got Liverpool just to our left. That body of water is going to give us a hand. And it is looking pretty sunsetty right now. We need to get on the ground. Once again, we're relying. It should be should be kind of in that general area. Just relying on our visual searching. Okay, the body of water is still kind of continuing down below us. We passed the John Lennon Airport already. Frankly, we could have probably landed on that. Uh, that's uh, Liverpool's airport. Remember, this, this body of water kind of approaches Manchester from the southwest in like a, a creek, basically. So, yeah, I've got the mouse on the screen. So the airfield should be kind of over in there-ish. Just because you found it once doesn't mean you're going to find it again. You know, we might have timed this just about right that the runway lights won't be on yet. I mean, in the in the simulator here, the runway lights are going to automatically come on when it's dark. Where is it? Still might be too far to the to the south and to the west in terms of looking. Hmm. 
Hmm. Where is it? We're only going to get one shot at this timing here. We got to find this dang thing. There's some old field I could probably land on if I needed to. So that's Liverpool. There's the water. The water leads up to Manchester. And the airfield is south of Manchester. That's the... dang it. That's, that's not what I need. Pretty aggressive turn here. Just trying to find it. Too far west still? Yeah, that would be it's the river. That would be, so we're still I think we're still too far west. Or maybe we're just at least looking too far west. We need to descend. Oh gosh, <laughs> there it is right behind me. Okay, so the lights, the lights did come on. That's okay. We gotta work on getting on the ground here. Autopilot's off. Auto throttles off. We will start applying some uh, flaps and brakes. Fourteen thousand feet. We gotta get on the ground. Air brake. Yeah, I was looking too far west. Okay. Oh, glad we found it. Um, we got to get lower and slow down. This is actually, this, this is going to work out pretty well. There's the twilight. Even the, the twilight affects my vision in the cockpit. My goodness. Probably a uh, seven, eight mile quartering right base to final. Gear down. Still going too fast for the gear to drop, but it will eventually. Flaps. Dropping some flaps. It is windy. My goodness. Now, for the record, I, I'm just picking the first runway that I saw. Van Zandt and his crew, the only way they would have known about the, the wind on the ground would have been through, you know, smoke or dust or something like that. Any automated weather systems would have been uh, likely out of service, so... We're not necessarily landing on the appropriate runway here. Ultimately, it looks like it's going to be okay with the wind for us, but uh, it was not planned. There we go. There's the gear. It's my overspeed warning. Our goal here is going to be to land and basically stop as soon as we can so we can disembark and uh, protect ourselves from any uh, dragons that may have noticed us on the way in. Plus Van Zandt kind of made it sound like they crashed a little bit. I, it's unclear. Come on now. 
we can't get we can't get too dirty in terms of uh, flaps and gear and everything. So we only got two engines. We got to keep the speed up here. Oh jeez. Parking brakes on. Come on now. Come on now. When you're flying something this big and heavy, this slow, it takes a while for your uh, control inputs to actually, jeez, actually do anything. Come on now. Come on now. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, all right. Chop and drop. We've made the runway. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Brakes, thrust reversers. Oh, geez. Whew. And we've done it. Flight of the Kentucky Irregulars. Disembark and uh, take up defensive positions. You know, landing towards the uh, towards the buildings here would have been probably what they would have wanted to do, so they could you know get and, and go defend themselves in any buildings you know for cover or something. I think we timed the uh, twilight pretty well here in terms of the, the actual sunset. All total, but uh, yeah, so. Flying across the ocean on two engines. It's, uh, it's, it's plausible. At least in the world of Microsoft Flight Simulator. Oh gosh, I am glad we had good weather when we landed. This was, uh, 9.23 p.m. with live weather. Still had 71% of fuel. I mean, my goodness. Note that the payload weight is still the same as when we took off, even though the percentage it reflects is lower now. And obviously everything's still on the highest difficulty levels, except except for the ATC voices when they were uh, sw telling us to switch frequencies, so. Well, there you have it. Flight of the Dragon Slayer. A brief aside about the movie, no story spoilers, FYI. Look at this poster. I was so excited for this movie. You've got Apaches and Cobras seemingly battling with dragons. That's what I wanted. None of that is in the movie. What a huge disappointment. On the topic of the helicopter and equipment though, it is interesting to note that the script of the movie does talk about the Kentucky Irregulars using an M1 Abrams and Black Hawk helicopters, not a British chieftain and an Augusta Westland. So if the writers thought this through as thoroughly as I have, they probably envisioned that Van Zandt's crew would have brought the tank and helicopter with them. However, as I mentioned, the chieftain tank they used in the movie is a British tank, so it's likely that at least in the movie universe, the Kentucky Irregulars got that once they were already in the UK. What an interesting flight. I got lucky with the weather, but getting that thing airborne on just two engines was tricky. Any other famous flights from books, movies, or TV you'd like to see attempted using real life strategies? Let me know in the comments, the Discord, or over on social media. Also, if you enjoyed this, consider supporting the channel on Patreon. It really helps. Thanks for watching.